Welcome again. Sri Lankan President Gotabaya Rajapaska has resigned. It's coming hours after arriving in Singapore on a flight from the Maldives, where he fled after mass protests over his rule. Singapore's government said he had been allowed entry on a private visit. It's not clear if uh, Mr. Rajapaska will be making Singapore his final destination or if he still plans to move. He had pledged to resign by Wednesday, but fled the country before doing so over public anger over the island's economic crisis. Well, Sri Lanka has been seen a days of protests against rising costs of food, fuel and other basic supplies. Calm has returned to Sri Lanka's main city of Colombo on Thursday as people awaited the resignation of President Gotabaya Rajapaksa, although a curfew was imposed and troops patrolled the streets to prevent any outbreak of violence. Left, 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 left. Don't be in the middle of this. Mr. Rajapaksa, who fled to the Maldives on Wednesday to escape a popular uprising over his family's role in a crippling economic crisis, has landed in Singapore. He has so far yet to resign despite promising to do so by Wednesday, which has stirred renewed uncertainty in the crisis-ridden South Asian country. His decision on Wednesday to make his ally, Prime Minister Ranil Wickremesinghe, the acting president, triggered more protests with demonstrators storming parliament and the premier's office demanding that he quit. Protests against the economic crisis have simmered for months and came to a head last weekend when hundreds of thousands of people took over government buildings in Colombo, blaming the powerful Rajapaksa family and allies for runaway inflation, shortage of basic goods and corruption. Inside the president's residence early on Thursday, ordinary Sri Lankans wandered the halls, taking in the building's extensive art collection, luxury cars and swimming pool. The usual protest sites were calm and organizers handed back the president and prime minister's residences to the government on Thursday evening. The government imposed a curfew in Colombo from noon on Thursday to early morning on Friday in a bid to further prevent unrest. Left, 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 left. Don't be in the middle of this. Local media showed armored vehicles with soldiers patrolling the city streets. He's basically telling you... In British politics, a former finance minister Rishi Sunak has won the most number of votes in the second round to succeed Boris Johnson as leader of the Conservative Party and Prime Minister. One candidate was eliminated today. Sunak came top with 101 votes, followed by junior trade minister and bookmaker's favourite Penny Mordaunt on 83 votes and Foreign Secretary Liz Truss on 64 votes. Attorney General Suela Breverman was eliminated with 27 votes. Lawmaker Tom Tugendhat received 32 votes and Kemi Badnock received 49 votes. Good afternoon. I can announce the results of the second ballot in the leadership election. As yesterday, I'll read the name of the candidate and the number of votes cast uh, in each case. Uh, first of all, 356 votes were cast out of a possible 358. The numbers are as follows. Badenoch, 49. Braverman, 27. Mordant, 83. Sunak, 101. Truss, 64. Tugendhat, 32. Therefore, under the rules, Suella Braverman is eliminated from the uh, contest and the others are able to go forward uh, to a further ballot on Monday. Thank you. Let's cross over to Italy, where the government under Prime Minister Mario Draghi is close to collapse after populist coalition partner Five Star pulled out of a major confidence vote. The ex-head of the European Central Bank has led a unity government since February 2021. But Five Star leader Giuseppe Conte accused him of not doing enough to tackle the cost of living crisis. Despite a comfortably winning Thursday's vote in the Senate, Mr Draghi's political future is now in doubt. The Prime Minister has insisted repeatedly 
that the government will not continue without Five Star. After the vote, he immediately set off to see President Sergio Mattarella, who was expected to ask him to remain in office. If the man dubbed Super Mario does decide to resign for lack of political support, Italians may be asked to go to the polls as early as this autumn. Well, tens of thousands of Argentines flocked to the streets of Buenos Aires today, expressing their discontent with President Alberto Fernandez as a South American country grapples with years-long economic crisis. Protesters gathered in Nine Mayo Avenue, one of Buenos Aires' main streets, marching onto the government palace at the National Congress. Uh, they held banners denouncing the IMF and calling for greater social security. Protesters want the money that finances its external debt to be spent on Argentina's poorest. A South American country's 12-month inflation rate is running at over 60%, which prompted the central bank to hike the benchmark interest rate by 300 basis points to 52% last month. And inflation could near 80% by the end of this year. The government of Latin America's third largest economy sealed an agreement with the International Monetary Fund in March to reschedule some $44 billion in debt, which comes with economic targets, including bringing down inflation. To our updates on the Russian invasion of Ukraine, now officials in Ukraine are saying Russian missiles have struck a city far from the eastern front line, killing at least 22 people, including three children. Some 100 major more were reported injured in the attack. This happened in Venetia, and it's in the southwest of Kyiv, a long way from the heart of the fighting in Donbass. Three Russian missiles hit an office block and damaged residential buildings. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has called it an open act of terrorism. The missiles hit the car park of the nine-story office block at around 10.50 local time. Ukraine's emergency services said residential buildings were also hit in the center of Venetia, which has a population of around 370,000 people. The Russian Defense Ministry, which denies targeting civilians, has yet to comment on the strike. But the Ukrainian presidency says the attack had come from caliber cruise missiles launched from a submarine in the Black Sea. Meanwhile, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has hailed what he calls substantive progress in ensuring the export of Ukrainian food products through the Black Sea. He was speaking to reporters at the UN headquarters in New York, saying a critical step forward was made to ensure the safe and secure export of Ukrainian food products through the Black Sea. He also said more technical work will be needed to materialize the progress, but the momentum is clear, adding that the aim of all parties is not just an agreement between Russia, Ukraine, and the UN, of course, but an agreement for the world. We have seen a critical step, a step forward to ensuring the safe and secure export of Ukrainian food products through the Black Sea. In a world darkened by global crisis, today at last we have a ray of hope. I travel to Moscow and Kyiv to propose solutions for both problems. Every day since, we have been working around the clock with intense behind the scenes talks with countless moving parts. More technical work will now be needed to materialize today's progress, but the momentum is clear. In the end, the aim of all parties is not just an agreement between the Russian Federation and Ukraine, but an agreement for the world. People are still dying. Fighting is still raging. But hopeful news from Istanbul shows the importance of dialogue. Let us take inspiration from that ray of hope to help light a way to a desperately needed negotiated solution for peace in line with UN Charter and international law. 
there was a, a substantive agreement on many aspects, uh, namely the questions related to the mechanisms of control, related to um, the uh, system of coordination, and uh, uh, relating to the questions of the mining, relation to many of the concrete, I would say, substantive aspects. Uh, but of course, uh, this was a first meeting. Uh, the progress was extremely encouraging. Uh, we hope that uh, now the delegations are coming back to their capitals, uh, and we hope that uh, the next steps will allow us to come to a uh, formal agreement. I never like to make predictions because uh, the predictions usually are never respected. Um, we are hoping that uh, we'll be able uh, to reconvene uh, very soon, uh, I'm sure uh, uh, next week, and hopefully we'll be able to have a final agreement. But, as I said, uh, we still need a lot of goodwill and commitment by all parties. They have shown it. I'm encouraged. I'm optimistic. But it's not yet fully done. I think we cannot overestimate the importance of this agreement. Uh, this agreement is uh, uh, an extremely relevant uh, step uh, in relation to addressing the food crisis, uh, together with the efforts we have been making in relation to the excess of uh, Russian food and fertilizers to the global markets. But uh, uh, I do not see immediately the uh, perspective of a peace agreement. Uh, I think, in any case, this demonstrated that the parties are able to have a constructive dialogue, and this is, of course, very good news. You might be wondering what uh, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has been talking about. It's the uh, talks going on in Istanbul between the Ukrainian leaders, Russian leaders, and as well UN officials. But Mr. Antonio Guterres also uh, speaking about other developments around the world, said the world is in deep trouble, and so too are the Sustainable Development Goals. He was addressing this time a high-level segment of the Economic and Social Council's high-level political forum on sustainable development, the Secretary General said time is running out, there is still hope. He identified four areas for immediate action. First, recovery from the pandemic in every country and the need to tackle food, energy and finance crisis and investment in people and ambitious climate action. The world is in deep trouble and so too are the sustainable development goals. Time is running out. But there is still hope, because we know what we need to do. And the senseless, disastrous wars now unleash a renewable energy revolution now, invest in people and build a new social contract now, and deliver a new global deal to rebalance power and financial resources and enable all developing countries to invest in the SDGs. Let's come together starting today with ambition, resolve, and solidarity to rescue the SDGs before it is too late. The ripple effects of Russia's invasion of Ukraine have hit amid a fragile and an even recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, while the climate emergency is gathering pace. Some countries are investing in recovery through a transition to renewable energy and sustainable development. But others are unable to do so, because of deeply rooted structural challenges and inequalities at global and national levels. The global financial system. The Swedish court has found a former Iranian official guilty of war crimes in connection with the mass executions of political prisoners in Iran in 1988. 61-year-old Hamid Nouri was sentenced to life in prison but what prosecutors said was his leading role in the killing of large numbers of opposition supporters. His lawyer says it would appeal, while Iran has called the verdict political. Mr. Nouri was arrested after flying to Sweden in 2019 and was tried under the principle of universal jurisdiction. He was the first person to face prosecution for participating in the executions, which Iran's establishment has never formally acknowledged.
The trial has strained relations between Sweden and Iran, which has been accused of using Iranian Swedish dual national centers to death on spying charges as a hostage in an attempt to force an exchange with Nuri. At least 89 people are reportedly killed during a week of gang warfare in the Haitian capital, Port-au-Prince. A mayor of, a, of a Cite Soleil neighborhood said two criminal alliances known as G9 and GPEP were fighting for control of the area. Mayor Joel Yenos told local radio that residents were under a state of siege. They lacked water, food and fuel. And gang violence has shut up since the assassination of President Jovenel Moïse by mercenaries a year ago. The latest deadly gang fight erupted on Thursday last week with no official death toll has been given. Local human rights group uh, RNDDH says it knows of only 89 people killed. President Joe Biden has continued his mid-east tour uh, still in Israel, though, where he and Prime Minister Yair Lapid have signed a joint pledge to deny Iran nuclear arms, a show of unity by allies long divided over diplomacy with Tehran. The undertaken, part of a Jerusalem declaration crowning Mr. Biden's first visit to Israel as president, comes a day after he told a local TV station he was open to a last resort use of force against Iran an apparent move towards accommodating Israel's calls for a credible military threat by world powers. And Washington and Israel have separately made veiled statements about possible preemptive war with Iran, which denies seeking nuclear arms for years. However, whether they have the capabilities or will to deliver on this has been subject to debate. And today, President Biden's statement reaffirmed with support for Israel's regional military edge and ability to defend itself by itself. Mr. Lappert's part, he cast this posture as a way of averting open conflict. We've laid out for the people, for, for, for the leadership of Iran, what we're willing to accept in order to get back into JCPOA. We're waiting for the response. When that occur, when that will come, I'm not certain, but we are not going to wait forever. By itself. We'll also to continue to work for, toward a lasting negotiated peace between the State of Israel and the Palestinian people. Israel must remain an independent, democratic Jewish state, the ultimate guarantee and guarantor of security of the Jewish people, not only in Israel, but the entire world. I believe that to my core. And the best way to achieve that remains a two-state solution for two people, both of them who have deep and ancient roots in this land, living side by side in peace and security. Words will not stop them, Mr. President. Diplomacy will not stop them. The only thing that will stop Iran is knowing that if they continue to develop their nuclear program, the free world will use force. The only way to stop them is to put a credible military threat on the table. The Iranian regime must know that if they continue to deceive the world, they will pay a heavy price. In the meantime, the United Arab Emirates has pledged $2 billion to help develop a uh, series of food parks in India to tackle food insecurity in Southeast Asia and the Middle East and the UAE. While speaking in Jerusalem at a virtual summit with UAE, Israeli and Indian leaders, U.S. President Joe Biden said the investment could increase India's food yields in the region threefold in just five years. And those parks will bring farmers, processors and retailers together using advanced climate technology to minimize waste conserve water and maximize crop yields. According to the U.S. and Israel, the four countries would also advance renewable energy projects in India. Prime Minister of the Republic of India, His Excellency Narendra Modi. We will begin today's ITU2 summit with opening statement. Well, joining me now is a foreign affairs commentator, Calvin Dark, here in Washington. Calvin, great to see you as always. And we turn to you now for 
you know, some guidance through what President Joe Biden is saying in Israel. And he, I want to read just a bit of, uh, you know, what some other reporters saying about um, what he'd said about Iran. And he pledged that the U.S. is prepared to use all elements of its national power to stop Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. What do you think the president is referring to here? To be honest, I don't know, and I'm not sure if President Biden has really figured out what that means. Because, you know, if we step back for just a moment, um, as you play clips from the press conference, it sends such a confusing message. You know, you've got at the top Israel and the United States clearly dedicated, not only just in rhetoric, but in the, you know, the memorandum of understanding they signed against the potential nuclear threat from Iran. But then you have President Biden talking about, you know, still allowing Iran to come back into the nuclear deal, which is diplomacy, when right beside him, the Israeli prime minister is saying diplomacy doesn't work. And so they're both there trying to talk about the threat, yet it's not clear exactly where they're both going and if Israel is willing to go with the United States on the road of diplomacy. And then, of course, Biden's saying he'll do whatever it takes. It sounded to me very heavy handed because think about it. If you're trying to use diplomacy to get Iran back into the nuclear deal, but saying there's a time limit on this before we potentially use military force, that really doesn't seem like diplomacy. Yeah, and it's pretty hard, you know, to decipher, uh, um, trying to decipher what exactly both are saying, as you said. I remember President Barack Obama uh, years ago uh, did say that if Iran crossed the red line, um, then the U.S. would react. Um, Iran did go on to cross the red line, and I think Israel even brought it to the U.S. president's notice, and yet nothing happened. So when you talk about heavy handedness against Iran, it's really not clear what U.S. policy is towards the country. You're exactly right on that. And that ties into one of the other kind of issues that I think is making this messy is U.S. credibility. Because let's think about it. Even if the United States and Iran and the other members of the Iran nuclear deal, the JCPOA, were able to come up with something that all of them could agree with, you get Iran thinking, well, you know, the last time there was a presidential election, um, the United States unilaterally you know, pulled out of this. And, you know, if you think about now, it's 2022, and you're saying, well, it'll be another two years before the U.S. presidential election. It's not even that far. We're talking about six months because we have the potential with the midterm elections that the Republicans could take over both houses of Congress and they could make it difficult for President Biden to re-enter the Iran nuclear deal or renegotiated one. So the U.S. is lacking credibility with Iran that even if they came up with terms that everyone could agree with, that we won't have a completely different U.S. policy in six months. And um, just wondering exactly, you know, what the other uh, JCPOA members really think about this, uh, because I think it was only France, I think, who'd asked for diplomacy uh, regarding Iran, uh, giving them more time to comply. But here you have Israel on the other side, calling for the most toughest measures against Iran. Uh, the new prime minister, uh, Yair Lapid, saying that Iran needs to know that if it does continue, uh, the free world will use force. And I, at this point, I'm wondering, you know, if he's talking about an invasion of Iran, um, and this would put, you know, U.S. and other countries in a pretty difficult situation, wouldn't it? Uh, because they're accusing Russia of doing the same thing right now. You're right. And while it would include the other, the former members of the Iran deal and then um, the members of whatever renegotiated deal there would be, it's really talking about the U.S. And one of the dynamics that is different from when Obama entered the deal is that there is decreasing support for getting into uh, more military conflicts, particularly in the Middle East. And, um, you know, this wholehearted support of Israel's we know Israel has different issues with Iran, and they're asking the United States to wholeheartedly support them in that. There's less support for that among um, Democrats and Republicans in this country. So it's not even clear that there would be even the same level of enthusiasm for a new deal if Joe Biden and his team were able to negotiate one. Do you think there will be another deal, uh, Calvin? I mean, the JCPOA is basically uh, dead right now. You think they can revive that deal? and get Iran to comply with um, uh, the, the necessary policies that have been uh, put down and make the rest of the world comfortable with Iran 
uh, at least still cultivating um, nuclear, using uh, nuclear energy for good? Two things I think about that. One is it would be extremely hard, but I think it's possible. I think you could come up with a renegotiated deal with terms that would please most everyone that they've at least decreased the threat except for Israel. And that's the second part. That's going to be very difficult because even if the United States got the Iran deal that they would like, Israel still sees Iran as an existential threat that they would only be using this deal to pull the wool over people's eyes in the, in the rest of the world. So even if there is that possibility of that elusive deal, I don't think Israel would be for it because they don't trust the Iranian commitment to any deal that they would agree to. Yeah, they don't trust. Well, the feeling is mutual anyway, the distrust. Uh, but the president heads on to Palestine tomorrow, and he'll be meeting with the Palestinian uh, President Mahmoud Abbas. How do you think that conversation will go? Um, there are very low expectations here about um, how that will go, um, unlike the kind of pregame show, as I call it, for what the president was going to do in Israel, what he was going to try to do in Saudi Arabia. The White House hasn't really put out any expectations of what they expect to come out of that meeting, which is sad because it shows that that's not one of their main priorities, as it should be. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking that this is just perfunctory. I wouldn't expect anything really groundbreaking out of it. Indeed. Carvin, thanks again for being with us. Thank you. Well, today is the National Day of France, uh, also known as Bastille Day. It's celebrated on July 14 every year with fireworks and parade, uh, one of the most important days in the history of the nation. It marks the fall of the Bastille, a military fortress and political prison, then considered a symbol of the monarchy and armory. France's President Emmanuel Macron led the celebrations in Paris for the French Bastille Day. Arriving in an open-top vehicle, the French president waved at the waiting crowd as military personnel on horseback and marching bands paraded on the Champs-Élysées Avenue. Spectators from all over France gathered on the avenue to watch the annual Bastille Day celebration. In the audience, many are filming and taking photographs of the troops and military vehicles parading. It was important for us to be here because it's an event we can't miss. As French people, it's important to support our country. And we are here with Americans and we wanted to show them how important it was for us to be here. Troops from Central and Eastern Europe also led the parade in Paris in an apparent defiance to the war in Ukraine and tensions in Eastern Europe. Delegations from Estonia, Lithuania, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania and Bulgaria marched ahead of the traditional French military parade, each carrying national flags of their respective countries. The countries, all NATO members like France, have been in the international spotlight since Russia invaded Ukraine in February, with many of them sharing borders with Ukraine or Russia. France's military display is led by a cadre of French-made Caesar self-propelled artillery systems, of which 12 have been sent by France to Ukraine, with plans to send six others. We're going now to Southern Africa, where the economic freedom fighters plans to bring a motion of no confidence against President Cyril Ramaphosa. They say the party wants the president to step down amid a scandal about millions of U.S. dollars found stuffed in the furniture at his farm. Addressing the media today, the EFF leader, Julius Malima, said they will approach the courts of South Africa and compel parliaments to conduct a thorough investigation of all crimes allegedly committed by President Ramaphosa. With the country's unemployment rate so high, petrol increasing and load shedding, Malima has called on South Africans to join in on the national shutdown and will see no school or workplaces open. Malima insists that President Ramaphosa has violated the people of South Africa, beg your pardon, peoples of South Africa, and as such must step down. When it comes to motion of no confidence, our approach is going to be a bit um, uh, different in that we are going to speak to all political parties 
uh, in Parliament, including the DA and the ANC. It's not some people in the ANC. We're going to write an official communique to the ANC and ask them to agree with us that a motion of no confidence must be passed. I'll tell you why. President Ramaphosa has confessed to his caucus, his own faction, that he's got no defense on the money, that the money was illegal, and that uh, he's got no answers, and therefore he must step down. It is alleged that, amongst others, it was Zaman Sol, uh, Oscar, Mab Oscar Mabuyani, Thailand Daveni, and them, who said to him, he must not resign, they will defend him. But the president has made a concession to his faction and to his core that he has got no moral uh, defense to those things. That's why you see the president can answer both to parliamentary questions or to any question. The president has got no reason not to answer because he has not been charged. So he can't say the matter is, uh, when the matter is in court, they say, subjudicate. He can't say the matter is subjudicate. So the president has got no answer, and he has made that concession. And the, he's held there by faction that feels, the likes of Lamola and them, that feels that if he leaves, they are going to become a collateral damage, and therefore they will have to live with him. So we are confident that the ANC people will themselves accept that the motion of no confidence must be put on the president if he does not uh, step down. Uh, newsroom. I have no confidence in uh, President Ramaphosa. He will approach you know, the courts to compel presidents going further, saying uh, the current cohorts of judges. Police Minister in Moving on to Northern Africa, Egypt is reclaiming its Suez Canal mudflats to use for industrial hub. It was once known as a graveyard for tanks, an Egyptian mudflat east of the Suez Canal has been reclaimed for what its backers hope will be a vast industrial zone for exports and domestic markets. Port Said Industrial Zone sits on the Mediterranean Sea, seven kilometers away from the city whose name it bears. It is one of four such zones under construction along the canal, a transit route for about 15% of global shipping traffic. Egypt runs a large trade deficit and has struggled to develop an industrial base. Economists say many of the industrial parks it has so far tried to create lie semi-vacant, partly because they are far from urban areas where workers live. The new industrial zones developers, private Egyptian companies, plus the military-owned National Service Projects Organization, NSPO, are hoping its position near Port Said City and a new city being built to the east means it will succeed where other similar projects have faltered. Our company has been assigned to develop an industrial zone in East Port Said. This area stretches over 16 million square kilometers and is in a genius location because the factories here can ship their product to Europe in 48 hours. As we all witnessed during the pandemic, the supply chains from China have been interrupted or halted. The East Port Said Company presents itself as an alternative, a smaller scale alternative for situations where the supply chain from China is halted. Until recently, the area was a waterlogged flatland notorious for bogging down military vehicles during the wars between Egypt and Israel. Israeli forces reached the Suez Canal in 1967 and stayed there until Egypt pushed them back in 1973. The Armed Forces Engineering Authority improved the soil in this area and used a technology that produced great results by packing the soil with sand and putting hoses underground to remove the groundwater this made East Port Said not only suitable for small-sized industries, but also for medium-sized industries.
Over the last four years, the NSPO has packed down soil and removed groundwater from an area covering 8 million square meters, solidifying the ground enough to handle light and medium industries. Four phases totaling 16 million square meters are due to be completed over 15 years. <laughs> Everything that's been done is part of a comprehensive vision for the area. There's an agricultural area, a port and logistics area, an industrial zone, where we are now, and a residential area, all of which lie on the borders of the Suez Canal and the Mediterranean Sea. This is part of a comprehensive plan to develop the entire area, which hasn't been developed for many years. This is the future of Egypt. Its first phase target is to lure Egypt's automotive firms by setting up painting, printing and dashboard producing lines. Its first factory, Neric, which will make carriages for trains and metro lines, is due for completion by June 2023. Construction on other factories is expected to begin by late 2022. Well, it's really hot here and uh, the rains have begun. A heat wave, however, is spreading across Europe, fueling wildfires in Portugal, France, even in Spain. Around 3,500 firefighters in Portugal are currently battling dozens of blazes as temperatures break records in various parts of the country. The worst has been reported in Lieira, where 600 people were forced out of their homes it's triggered memories of deadly wildfires back in 2017, which claimed the lives of more than 100 people. Heat waves have become more frequent, more intense and longer lasting because of climate change. The world has already warmed by, by about 1.1 degrees Celsius since the industrial era began. Wildfires continue to rage across tinder dry country in Portugal, Spain, France and Croatia on Thursday, burning homes and threatening livelihoods, as much of Europe baked in a heat wave that has pushed temperatures above 110 degrees Fahrenheit. In Croatia, authorities deployed firefighting aircraft and dozens of firefighters and soldiers to try to contain three major wildfires along the country's Adriatic coast. Fire came down the felt on the side of the house here and caught a, a light, the olive trees, and it jumped um, into the trees next to the house and set the house alight. No, the second floor is completely damaged um, and there's just some other damages around the house. All the window um, frames and shutters are also burnt out. And thousands of people were evacuated in Turkey's southwestern Datka Peninsula as firefighters battled to contain blazes fanned by strong winds that spread to residential areas overnight. <laughs> Countries including France and Portugal suffering from a second heat wave in as many months have been hit by a series of wildfires over the last few weeks. Scientists say human-induced climate change is making heat waves more likely and more severe. Elsewhere in Europe, thousands of firefighters battled more than 20 blazes that raged on Wednesday across Portugal and western Spain, menacing villages and disrupting tourist holiday amid a heat wave that pushed temperatures above 113 degrees Fahrenheit, that's about 45 degrees Celsius, in some parts of the region. We've seen some terrible pictures of rivers dried up effectively because of drought, lack of water across Europe. And, you know, that's a risk for, for every country in Europe at the moment. And when we don't have access to water, that's, you know, not only a problem for, you know, water supplies for domestic, you know, drinking and washing and, and the basics of life, but also it increases the risk of things like forest fire. So when everything's so very, very dry, um, then you've got this, this additional hazard on top. Um, so it, it just makes everything more dangerous. Meanwhile, on the Greek island of Samos, two people died on Wednesday after a helicopter fight in a forest fire crashed into the sea. Greece is also plagued by wildfires every year due to hot and dry weather conditions. The European Union is sending more than 200 firefighters from various countries in Europe to assist the country throughout the summer. With human-caused climate change triggering droughts, the number of extreme wildfires was expected to increase 30% within the next 28 years, and that's according to a February 2022 UN report.
And in Germany, one year to the day after the country's worst natural disaster in half a century, which killed more than 180 people, President Frank Walter Steinmeier has turned the region to pay tribute to the victims. During a visit to a carpenter's workshop in the state of Rhineland Palatinate, Steinmeier and State Premier Malo Dreyer listened to the owner's recounts of the night of July 14, 2021, when the EHR River, the Arl River, beg your pardon, turned into a torrent and flooded and destroyed entire villages along its path. For many in the Arl Valley, the lush winemaking region that became the epicenter of the floods, life remains difficult. Locals say they do not know when they will be able to return home, and applications for public aid are complex. Craftsmen are often booked out, building material is scarce, and construction permits take time. The owner of the carpenter's workshop, Mike Reinfart, told Steinmeier, who holds a largely ceremonial role, that people were looking for more information, such as on which roads and bridges would be reconstructed next. As State Premier Malu Dreyer says, uh, did acknowledge some of the demoral demoralizing challenges, but said much progress has been made. A self-portrait of Dutch post-impressionist artist Vincent van Gogh has been uncovered, hidden behind one of his paintings in Scotland. National Galleries of Scotland says art conservators made the discovery, believed to be a first for a UK institution during an X-ray examination of Van Gogh's 1885 artwork, Head of a Peasant Woman, for an upcoming exhibition. The image was hidden behind cardboard and layers of glue. Van Gogh is known to have often reused his canvases, working on their reverse side as well. National Galleries of Scotland said its experts were looking at how to remove the glue and cardboard, covering the self-portrait without damaging head of a peasant woman. The X-ray image will feature at the July 30 to November 13 exhibition called A Taste for Impressionism at the Royal Scottish Academy in Edinburgh. And a handwritten Mozart manuscript, a flight book from the bombing of Hiroshima, as well as a cassock worn by Pope Francis, so just among a range of items lined up for grabs on an online sale by US-based heritage auctions. 52 lots are being offered in the historical platinum session signature auction, described as spanning 500 years of human innovation and covering fields such as literature, science and history. One of the top plots with a bid of $400,000 today is a logbook written by U.S. Army Air Forces officer Captain Robert Lewis, one of the pilots of the Enola Gray, Enola Gay, uh, the plane that dropped the first nuclear bomb used in warfare over the Japanese city of Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. Other lots relate to American aviation pioneer Amelia Earhart, who vanished while attempting a round-the-world flight in 1937 including photographs and letters, as well as a telescope belonging to the astronomer Clyde Tombaugh, who discovered Pluto. There are also draft works from authors like Sherlock Holmes, creator Arthur Conan Doyle, and working manuscripts from composers Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart and Ludwig van Beethoven. 100 years of human innovation in this catalog. We start with... Um, a Gutenberg Bible leaf. So 1452 about all the way up to material that went to the moon um, on Apollo 11. And every so many significant human achievements in terms of literature, science, um, general history, American history. Um, we have artifacts the material that witnessed those events, and now we're presenting them here to our clients. We have the flight book, the only in-flight log from the Enola Gay. So the Enola Gay was the plane um, that carried Little Boy, the nuclear bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. So we have, um, it's just a small notebook that the co-pilot was given by a reporter and asked just to take notes in. And so you have eight pages of his thoughts and just kind of a play-by-play, hour-by-hour, minute-by-minute 
of exactly what happened on the ride, on the trip, on the plane ride to Hiroshima. And then they drop the bomb and he literally writes, there will be a short intermission while we bomb, period. Yeah, so the really cool thing about um, both the music and literary manuscripts is that they're working manuscripts. So, um, you know, they're they're not perfect. They're in good condition, but not great condition because, you know, they were carried around, they were worked on, they have um, corrections and annotations in the author or composer's hand. I mean, it, it wasn't just they sat down and write, wrote something, you know, brilliant and beautiful and it came out with perfect fluidity. I mean, you can see their genius at work as they're writing, as they're correcting, as they're changing their mind and refining. Um, and that's incredible because the, the process, I think, is more fascinating and more revealing than the finished product. So we get to see kind of behind the curtain um, of, of these incredible minds. Well, not just the incredible minds, but walking back into history at the moments when these events were taking place. Thanks for watching The World Today. I'm Amarachi Obama.